The series that we're concluding today, Life on Purpose, I commenced it by talking about uh, a life of worship, that you can't really find your purpose in life unless the God-shaped void in our hearts is filled by Jesus Christ and he'd be at the very centre of our lives. And then everything, direction comes and your life gets ordered, meaning, purpose flows. And so we begin with worship, but when you are a worshipful Christian and you're living a life of purpose to please God, and worship is a way of life, not just a time of singing and praise, but to live a life that is so pleasing to God because he is so pleased with us when we're in Christ. And because he saves us and his life is through the Holy Spirit comes to live within us, then we just want to be like him in our conduct. And so worship is a way of life. And that expresses itself most beautifully in wanting to talk about Jesus to others. And so evangelism, it's a wonderful word, or reaching out to other people. That's what evangelism is. And and I want to focus on a man named Philip who did it three ways. And I've been reflecting on Philip. I, I reflect on him quite a lot. He's actually a dear friend. I've tried to put myself in his shoes. And I did a message um, a few years ago at our CRC National Conference about Philip. But I've never actually taken this line before. But I've thought about this, that in the story of Philip, we see that he reached out to others in three ways. And his example inspires us today. It inspires me. And uh, and I trust I can inspire you to do it like Philip. And there are three ways that he shows us by his life. And Dr. Luke, when he wrote the book of Acts, I'm sure he was intrigued by Philip. He, he, He devotes a whole chapter to him, which is pretty unusual. So Luke, in 28 chapters covering 25 to 30 years of the, the early church, maybe 35 years, put a whole chapter to this guy is, is pretty important. I want us to see how hard it was for Philip initially and how God used him in spite of the sh- were born in Jerusalem, Judea, and they spoke Aramaic, Hebrew, and, and, but there were m- hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of Jews, maybe a couple of million, right throughout the Roman Empire, and of course the, the national language of the Roman Empire was Greek, not Latin, believe it or not. So it was a Greek-speaking world under Roman authority and power. And so people, if you're born in Athens or born in Rome or born in, in uh, Syria, you spoke Greek. And so they were Greek Jews. And so every year they would come to Jerusalem to worship, which was the practice. And so it seems like Philip and a bunch of others, many others were there. And on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down in power, many of them got converted. And so we we discover Philip that he was selected by Peter and James and John, the 12 apostles who led the church in in Jerusalem. And the church in Jerusalem probably was now heading to around 20,000 people. And it was a massive church. And they had some practical problems. For example, the Greek women, uh, Hellenistic Jewish Christians, uh, they were complaining that the uh, Hebraic women were receiving more favour. It's a bit of division in the church. And so 20,000 people, the the, the Greek-speaking Jews who became Christians didn't have any income and so people supported them. So the women, and um, I'm Greek and I know Greek women can cause a lot of trouble. And so they caused a bit of trouble. And so, you know, Peter and James and John, they go, oh, we can't afford, we can't. What do you want us to do? Like, you get the frustration. We're praying and preaching and helping people. And they said, who are the natural, who are some good people? And they chose seven men. Stephen, Philip, Nicanor, and Prochorus, people, all Greek names. And they became the next leadership group, but it was an administrative group. It wasn't a preaching 
pastoral group. It was a group that could administer finances, food and facilities and, and to help people to function because it was a huge church. So that's where we come across Philip. And uh, he's just, he's not a preacher, he's not an evangelist, he's not a pastor, uh, he's a practical guy, he's serving. And so, but life is beautiful in Jerusalem in spite of uh, the, the difficulty that I had between, between the women. It never happens in the Christian Family Centre. Women are just fantastic. They never, particularly the Greek women, aren't they fabulous? So anyway, Philip's happily serving in Jerusalem and, uh, and then a terrible situation happens. His best friend Stephen gets murdered. A murder in the church. And he's taken and, uh, and a whole chapter is devoted to Stephen's murder, the first martyr of the church, beautiful young man. And uh, the religious Pharisees kill him, they, they stone him to death and they uh, abuse him and beat him. And then they think, man, we killed one of them, why don't we kill a lot? So this murderous ISIS kind of maniacal, possessed thing grips them and they get orders from the Sanhedrin Roman authorities kind of wink at it and they're going around arresting people, killing people and Saul, who becomes the great apostle Paul, was the chief prosecutor, the chief arrester, chief harasser. So he's causing havoc. And so Philip, like so many of the young men, they just take off. And it says that the, the, the 12 apostles stayed in Jerusalem and said, Philip just takes off. It's hard. He is grieving. He is crying, his heart is rent and he's just going. Where does he go? He doesn't know where to go because if he thought clearly, he wouldn't go where he ended up going, which is Samaria. Because Samaria was a place where you have further trouble because the Samaritans and Jews hated each other and it was great hostility. So he goes there and then he finds himself in a town called Sychar and Sychar is controlled by a male warlock, a male witch, a sorcerer, who has such dominating power that everyone's scared of him and thinks that he's God in human form. So he's in this town that's hostile to Jews and secondly, controlled by some occult power of darkness. And so no one in their right mind who's a, who's a, who's a Jew and, and a Greek-speaking Jew would go there. But he's, you can get the feeling like he's grieving, he's upset, he takes off and uh, it's a hard, hard, hard time for him and yet we see in this hard time like we at times face incredibly difficult circumstances hard times painful times times of suffering you know it's during those times that God gets our attention sometimes when everything's going well ah, oh, we pray we read the Bible we attend church we might skip a week home oh yeah like we just cruise along and, you know, we, we just, you know, life is good. Things go a little bit wrong and all of a sudden your prayer life comes alive, doesn't it? And the Bible, start, you start to read a little bit more and, and, and church, you know, you, God gets our attention. And I think Philip, um, God grabbed his heart, grabbed his attention. I think as he's heading towards Samaria, I reckon he's praying, I reckon he's saying, God, I just want to serve you. I, mean, I was happy in Jerusalem, you know, what's going down? I reckon he's praying, he's talking, he's probably using his spiritual prayer language because he'd received the gift of the Spirit, praying in the beautiful gift of tongues and worshipping and not knowing what to pray but he's praying and he finds himself in this situation and uh, you know, he doesn't know what to do. Do you know what he does though? He does what everyone who's encountered God does. He wants to talk about Jesus. If you're a worshipper, if Jesus is at the centre of your life, and he certainly was in Philip's life, the thing that he, he just couldn't help but do is just to talk about Jesus. So preaching is talking about Jesus. So what I'm doing today, I did last night, and I'll do tomorrow, just one-on-one, -on -one, just people. So I'm like having a conversation with just Philip and, uh, you know, with you and you and you and, and that. I might get a little bit more animated with a group of people, but it's still just talking. It's talking about Jesus. That's what preaching is. And the Bible tells us that we are all called to actually share and talk about Jesus. And it comes natural if you are a worshipper and if Christ is at the very centre of your life. Let me read here Philip in the story. Let's read and see how God used him in this hard time. 
On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. Saul began to destroy the church. How's that? Going from house to house, he dragged off. Just can you imagine that? Grabbing people by the hair, just dragging them off with anger, a, a kind of violent streak in this man, put him in prison. And those who'd been scattered preached the word, just talked about Jesus wherever they went. Philip went down to a city of Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. As I said, he went to Sychar. You read the whole chapter and you see where this demonic guy is as well. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, all paid close attention. So somehow, as he's talking about Jesus, Jesus turns up through the Holy Spirit and as people are listening to him, faith is kind of rising in people's hearts. You know what's happening? People that are bound by evil spirits because sorcery was so powerful there. That warlock, Simon Magus, I think he was hexing people and they're getting possessed as they're coming under his power. And so what's happening is, is that these evil spirits are leaving and people are getting free. Say, man, I'm free. And the Holy Spirit comes into their lives and, and some of them who are sick, they start getting healed. I reckon Philip's eyes would have popped out. He's never done that before. Where did he do that in the Jerusalem church? No evidence of it. But I reckon he was looking at Peter and James and John as they were doing it, like you boys look at me sometimes and look at Pastor Phil and Cass and Tim and I hope you're looking and maybe a little voice will say to you, hey, we can do that. Maybe we can preach. Maybe we can pray for the sick and they'll get healed. Yeah. You ever think like that? You do? True. Well, talk to me later. Because <laughs> I used to, I used to sit in the front row and watch Leo Harris, the founder of the CRC, and I'd be hanging, I'd be like this, 17 or 18 year old, how does he do that? So he'd be praying for somebody to be healed and he was such a stately man and he would go, you know, he said, now what can't you do, what can you do that you couldn't do? The person goes, well, I couldn't lift my arm but I can lift it a little bit. He would say, well, we'll rejoice. <laughs> All right. Because should we pray again? Yeah, do it again. And the third, and I'm thinking, this guy's getting healed instantly in front of him. How does he do that? He does persistence, faith, testing and, uh, and I'm just watching him and a little voice would speak to me saying, you can do that. Oh, I can't do that. I'm, I'm not a pastor. I wouldn't be so audacious. To, and I used to think those thoughts were terrible thoughts. But you can do all the stuff it says in the Bible. If you're a believer, these signs will follow those who believe. It doesn't say those signs will follow those who are called to be the pastors. So I reckon Philip's watching and he's learning. So when he goes to Samaria, what does he do? He says, well, how did Philip, how did, how did Peter do that? How did James do that? How did John do that? How did Bartholomew do that? How did Thomas do that? And things started happening. You see, we can see here in this story how God used this diff, terrible, diff, terribly difficult time that Philip and the Jerusalem church was facing for his own purposes. God is sovereign over your life. The devil's not in charge of your life. The devil doesn't control your destiny. In fact, even your own sinfulness and your own mistakes don't, do not define you as a person. That's just an experience. So you trip over and fall over. So your sin nature messes with you. So the world's temptations might get you down. So the devil might be sitting on your shoulder and, and inspiring you to do something wrong. Well, that's just life. But that doesn't define you as a human being. You are loved by Jesus Christ, you are saved by Jesus Christ, and He is sovereign over your life. And even when bad things happen to good people, God sovereignly works to cause good to come in that situation if the person will turn their hearts to Him. And I reckon Philip, his heart is turning to God during this difficult time. And, uh, and, and, and God sovereignly starts to work. So God is sovereignly working all the time for your good. And God so wants to do good, not just to you, but through you to other people. And so you see, here's what it says in Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, you want to say it with me? In all things, not some things, not 99.9, .9, in all things, God works for the good 
of those who love him. Do you love him? Yes. Well, God is working for the good, even though some things that have happened to you or may be happening to you now are not good. They're downright bad and they're horrible and, and it's suffering and it's pain. And God's not the cause of it. Let's not confuse it. But God is in charge. And let him capture your heart and you will see good taking place in your life and through your life to influence other people. For those who have been called according to his purpose, it says that. Wonderful. Quite often it's through the hardships and the suffering that we go through that God gets our attention and our hearts are moved to reach out to him for his personal help and he so readily touches our lives in these troubling times and then uses us to reach out to others who face needs, great needs. I, I went to the Solomon Islands. Let me show you the map of the Solomons, just in case you don't know where they are. There's Papua New Guinea, there's Queensland. And so I go to Papua New Guinea every year. First time I've been to the Solomon Islands. There's Vanuatu, hope to go there, New Caledonia. And uh, the Solomon Islands are a thousand islands on that chain. I went to the island of Guadalcanal, where the capital is Honiara. I did not realise, I knew in my head that it was a, a significant battle area in the Second World War. But for some of you who know more than me about the Second World War, uh, that's where the Japanese were, were defeated, basically. If we, if we lost Guadalcanal, we would not have, Australia would have been invaded. The airfields there would have been able to bomb Brisbane where a million American soldiers were. If they took Port Moresby, then the whole, the Brisbane line would have come in. They, the government actually had cut Australia in half and said, the Japs can have the first half until we recoup. And so it was that serious. And so they had to go in there to get that airstrip. 118,000 Japanese boys died in that area where I was walking. They're still finding munitions. We don't know how many thousand American men lie, but there are 40 battleships in a place just where I could see it, like, like Gulf St. Vincent. 40 battleships, aircraft carriers, cruisers that were sunk there. It's called Iron Bottom Sound. It's actually a gravesite. You can't do a lot of stuff there. It, it, it's, it's sacred. 40 ships, huge ships sunk, and all those boys are there, dead, or decomposed now. So I realised when I was there, it blew me away. Wow, so I went to the, to the monuments and all that. And then I see this high school called Florence Young High School. And, uh, and then her name pops up every so often. Who's this Florence Young? And I found out the story. I start Googling. And Mr. Google never lies. So I read up everything about her. Man, I couldn't get enough information. I've tried to buy her book, Pearls of the Pacific. There she is. Look at that little girl. She's probably in her early 20s there. Now she's a bit older. She was brought up in New Zealand as a Plymouth Brethren, very strict religious upbringing. Her parents suddenly die. Don't know what the story is, how they die, that's why I want to read her story. And uh, so she's brought up Christian faith, but like some of these kids here, brought up in the Christian faith, but maybe not fully alive in her faith. Anyway, she has an encounter with God, powerful encounter. The Holy Spirit moves upon her life and it's transformative. And she just falls in love with Christ and really becomes renewed. Anyway, she had to go to Queensland where her brothers were running sugarcane plantations. And they were quite wealthy young men and did very well. So they, she goes there in her late teens, early 20s, and there she, she's working there for her brothers, and there's all these Kanakas that are there. Now the Kanakas, it's a derogatory term, really. But the Kanakas, you know what they were? Go back to that thing. Go back to that map. Men on slave ships from Australia, they didn't call them slave ships, would actually go to the South Sea Islands and kidnap people, young boys, and bring them to work in the sugar plantations. I'll give them a few little trinkets, a bit of money, but basically it was, it was slavery. But those boys in the Solomon Islands were the worst place in the world for cannibalism and headhunting. But that you'd go there, they would eat you. They'd chop your head off and collect it. And you go to places, there's great, all these heads collected. The island of, of, of Chosu, up to the early 1900s, which is just north of Guadalcanal, where Pastor Jimmy comes from, they emptied it because the people from New Georgia would go and raid it, kill the men, eat the people, eat them and collect their heads. It was empty. I mean, it was a really ugly, horrible, nasty place. They worshipped all these devil gods and the British ultimately took it on as a protectorate 
in, I think, 1890s. I could be wrong there, early 1900s. So these boys were pretty uncouth. And some of their habit patterns were repulsive to young Florence Young. Wouldn't wear clothes and just their hygiene and habits and, and, and so kind of like she just as a prim and proper, just put the photo of Florence. They reckon she just looked fantastic to the day she died. Really tall, upstanding young woman and older woman. But the love of God in her heart said, these people need Jesus Christ. She's going through a hard time grieving. She had this experience in God. So she, in spite of her feelings of repulsion towards some of the habits that she was seeing, she leads one to Christ. Leads a second one to Christ. She starts teaching him the Bible. Within three or four years, 2,100 of these boys had come to Christ, mostly men. She sets up little Bible study groups. <laughs> they ultimately became little churches. And she starts to develop them. And then she gets called to go to China in the 1890s. She goes to China during the great upheaval of the Boxer Rebellion. And the Boxer Rebellion is where there's this great animosity towards Western imperialism and they want to kill all the British and Americans and French because they're carving up China like a lemon. They're abusing the Chinese. It's a pre-revolutionary period before Sun Yat-sen and the revolution that ended the, the imperial dynasty and so there's, there's millions of people are being murdered. If you want to see a film about it, see 55 Days in Peking with Charlton Heston, that tells you the story. She goes there, her life is threatened, she has a complete mental breakdown. Breaks down, comes back to Australia, what does she do? She goes back working with the Kanakas. Then she sends them, some of the boys, she teaches them enough English and also skilling them in pidgin English to be able to communicate the gospel, sends them back to the islands and they get killed. They eat them. You know, like, because they eat you to eat, get your strength, you know, you can follow this God, this, you know. And so, I mean, it's pretty rough. So she starts going there. And she goes there every year into this t difficult area to 1926. She lived till 1940. Out of that is birthed the third largest church movement in the South Pacific called the South Sea Evangelical Church. There are hundreds of churches in Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Papua New Guinea, and I never knew about her. I've fallen in love with her. This wonderful little girl who went through amazing hardships and a time of great personal difficulty, loss, of her family and then her own mental health and yet God grabbed her heart and used her to lead thousands of people. The island of Malaita, 47% of the people are all belong to the South Sea Evangelical Church. Why the CRC, our movement, loves them is because some of our pastors were brought up in that and they love that church and they get on very well. You see, God can use hardships. You might be going through a really hard time right now let God capture your heart. Let him do something in you so that he can do something through you. And God can use your great pain for his glory and he can work through you to help others, help them to see Jesus in you so they can discover Jesus for themselves. So Philip, he reached out to others when life was very hard. And maybe in this Christmas season, God wants you to be reaching out to others even though life's a bit of a stinker at the moment. And there's some stuff going down. But you know, as Pastor Tim said, we've got the Christmas in the square. We've got the hampers of hope. We've got Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Opportunities. Where in spite of your pain, let God capture your heart and may this become a time in spite of your feelings where you will reach out to other people even in your pain. Let God work through you. And maybe at this time, you're going to see things happen that perhaps wouldn't happen when things are going really well. It's true. So, Philip reaches out to others when life was very hard. And secondly, he reached out to others when God was clearly guiding him. This is the second way. I see the three ways by which God used Philip to reach people. When God was guiding him. I mean, the story is an amazing story. So, from heartbreak with his mate dead, in this hostile territory, God starts to use him in the hard time. So, you would think, man, this life is turned around a bit. Things are starting to happen. And he's probably developing a community, people that love him and know him. Let's say if there were, uh, let's say there were 150 people that got converted. Let's say 30, 40 people got healed, 20 people got delivered of demons and there's joy. It, it just seems like there was a whole community that came to faith. I, I don't think the revival was millions of people. They're, they're small towns. 
So probably in the hundreds, perhaps, at, at most. So he's having a good time. He's got a new community. He's got some friends. And then God starts to speak to him and says, leave it. What? I was in heaven in Jerusalem. Then it became hell. You s- I'm, I'm in Samaria. It was really rough. But we dealt with that demon, Simon Magus. And we got people saved. We've got a good church going. You want me to go? Where do you want me to go? The desert. But there's grass here. There's food. The desert. So God breaks into his life. Somehow he's attuned and he's hearing the voice of God and says, go to the desert. And he's going there and there's nobody there. Do you want to read the story with me? It's a great story. It says, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Sometimes when we hear the voice of God, we think it's the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it's an angel. Just could be speaking. See, if you, there's angels here in this place today. You can't see them. If you say, oh, I don't believe it unless I see it. Hey, it's a mercy you don't see them because if you see them, you'd probably die of a heart attack. <laughs> there have been times when I've sensed angels, presence in the room. And it's not just... There have been times when I felt somebody behind me breathing and, and like touching the... So I remember Pastor Philip, I told Philip my experiences once. I said, Philip... I thought it was him touching me. I'm sitting in the front row here, getting to preach something. <laughs> Leave me alone. It's like somebody was stroking the back of, and it's kind of like a breath. I'd look around, it's just Philip there. And, then... <laughs> and when it happened, it was, look, it was during a time of difficulty for me. And really, to tell you the truth, there were times when I didn't want to preach. I was just going through some hard times. And, and I just felt like death warmed up. I never told the people that, of course, you know, I was a good pastor. And then when that would happen, it was like, I'd, as I'd, I'd feel like a million bucks. And I'd get up and I'd be like, I'm a different person. And I never recognised what it was. But I think it was just an angel or the Holy Spirit, I don't know, just saying, come on, son, go, go, go. let me just breathe it. And I'd sort of like a, a new coat would come on me during this difficult time. So I don't want to be spooky about it, but I think there are angels all around. My wife got converted as an eight-year-old, and you've probably heard her story, and we're pretty convinced there was an angel in the room because she saw light. She's only a little kid. It's hard for her to process that. Was it physical or was it in her mind? Sometimes in the Scripture it doesn't say, it seemed like, was it in their mind, in their subconscious, that God kind of breaks through and you see or was it really an angel? We don't know, but it was certainly a visitation that took place. And she got converted and got baptised in the Holy Spirit and started speaking in, in this beautiful language as an eight-year-old. And that prepared her for hell the next few years with the, the terrible stuff that was happening in her family. And that's what, you know, God does things like that. He breaks through. So God is guiding this man. So he says, okay, an angel. And he says, look at this. So he started out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch. Do you all know what a eunuch is? Anyone doesn't know? There's a couple of doctors here. They will tell you. And if you want the procedure done, they will do it. (laughs) An important official in charge of all the treasury of, of, of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. It's a black man. He's somehow been sent by the queen to check out this religion or whether there might have been some Jews in Ethiopia, so they go there. So he's on his way back, and uh, he's a bit confused. But uh, on his way home, he's sitting in the chariot, reading the book of Isaiah. So Philip is down in the desert, so he's, so he's just looking, and, and there's, he sees the, a caravan. So he, he just kind of noses up a little bit quiet as they're going along. And the Spirit of God says, that chariot, get up there. I mean, this has to be God. He goes up and the guy is reading the book of Isaiah. Have a guess what chapter he's reading. Chapter 53, the great messianic chapter that talks about Jesus. God is so strategic. And he's in his plans to save individuals and the various people groups of the world. So look what happens through this God-arranged appointment. It says, and Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading the, uh, Isaiah the prophet. And Philip asked him the question. This, do you understand what, you, what you're reading? Because I think he looked at the guy's face thinking... He doesn't really understand. I think he read the body language. And the guy goes, how can I? 
And someone explains it to me. So he invites Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of Scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. This is Jesus, Isaiah 53. And as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked this question. What a question. What a fantastic question. Please, could you tell me, what the heck is this about? Is he talking about himself or somebody else? And Philip can't believe his eyes. He's thinking, man, this is like made in heaven. This is like... God has organized this and Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him what? The good news about Jesus. That's preaching to one person, to the, to the crowds in, in Sikar in Samaria. He tells him the good news. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, hey, here's some water. What stands in the way of me getting baptized? Philip goes, nothing, mate. Let's get it done. So they go in and he gets baptised in water, the eunuch goes his merry way, happy, rejoicing. Tradition tells us that he goes and tells Kandasi, his queen, she gets saved, and she decrees for the nation to come to Christ. And they reckon Ethiopia is the first Christian nation. It's still a Christian nation to this day. Amazing. We haven't got historical proof on that, but that's what they say in tradition. So, hey, God supernaturally, supernaturally can guide you and he will guide you. You're sitting in a facility, and this wasn't made just by the hands of men and women. God supernaturally spoke to us in 1981, when we had no money, a handful of people in the church to go and buy this five-acre property. And we, we didn't have the money. It was worth about $600,000 then. And there are people here who remember the story. Ian Hunt had led our property research committee. A miracle happened. We bought the thing for $80,000 in league with the state government. They helped us. Amazing. In those days, the government's really helped you. (laughs) Miracle. Miracle land. Amazing. I call it a signpost miracle. You can read up the story on it. We've written it up. It's an amazing story. Supernatural. God speaking. Was it an angel? Was it God? I don't know. But clearly, we start planting churches. So we're thinking, well, within a 30-minute radius, you know, because where people are driving from. So we think, okay, yeah, 30 minutes, I can see Hallett Cove, we can see up in the hills, we can see out of harbour, we can see the eastern suburbs. I'm driving through Murray Bridge, minding my own business, just daydreaming as I'm driving. I wasn't praying. And I hear the voice of God saying, this is the first place you're going to build, this is the first place you're going to plant the church in. I think, what? I don't want to plant a church here, it's 100 kilometres, too far to go. Like, where did that come from? Was it an angel in the car just saying, Bill? Was it the Holy Spirit? I don't know. So I, I, that happened. At that very moment, for a few weeks beforehand, there were a group of people sitting in that book, the back corner where the door is, coming to church on a Sunday, sneaking in when everyone had actually been singing and sneaking out before we finished. They were from Murray Bridge and they'd heard of the Christian Family Centre and they wanted us to start a church there. And we even knew they existed. God speaks, circumstances, cut a long story short, 1990, we plant the church, now it's a church of 700 men, women and children, going going gangbusters, the biggest church in town. (coughs) Only God. In the um, 8.30 service, ah, the best part of the service was not my preaching. I had somebody interrupt me while I'm preaching. And she has never done this in the 35 years she's been in the church. She's the most amazing human being. Her name is Dorothy Clemens. She's probably 85. She looks like she's 55. And she's just stood up and says, Pastor Bill, I've got to say. Just couldn't. And story, her husband, Ron, we've been praying for him for all the years. Ron comes every Christmas, comes Easter, comes with Dorothy. She's never stopped praying. He's never given his life to Christ. Well, just the other day, he gave his life to Christ. She led him to Christ. Through a hardship, he's going through a hard time and uh, he's very seriously ill. So his beautiful daughter Debbie writes him a letter, a Holy Spirit inspired letter and Dorothy said, she's never done this before and she said something like, Dad, 
I love you so much that I, I want to see you in heaven. Wow. I want to see you in heaven. And, and then Dorothy says, he never responds. He always says, oh, tomorrow we'll talk about it. So she writes this beautiful letter and sends a little booklet. And Dorothy says, Ron, do you want me to read it to you? She goes, yes. So she, he's, she's reading it to him, reading it to him. Within 24 hours, he gives his life to Christ. And now he's starting to grow in his Christian faith. And, and uh, I'm going to pop in and see him tomorrow with Dorothy just to congratulate him. But you see, that's a Holy Spirit moment. That somebody writes a letter and... and you know, to somebody that had, it was, he was a too hard basket man, if you know him. Really hard, I'd have had many talk with him, but God knows there's no too hard, hard of a person, there's no one that's too hard, there's no too difficult a circumstance, so don't give up on that wayward son or daughter or brother or uncle, that wild cousin that gives you trouble, pray for them, you never know, God can transform their hearts, never give up on people. And the Holy Spirit starts to work. We're out for tea last night, and we're at just the local restaurant. There's a little girl there, and she looked like one of the indigenous kids or that comes to church here. I thought I saw her. So I just said, well, the fellow said, hey, you, you, you visited the Christian Family Centre? She goes, no. <laughs> but, you know, the church around the corner, you know, and I said, oh, that, you know, you've been there? I think I've seen No, no, I haven't been. All right, sorry. So she was fine then. Everyone goes and I'm paying the bill and she was the girl out of all the people, all, all the, and she was there and I said, oh, I'm sorry for, for uh, I thought you were the wrong person and I had about a minute and I just felt this is a God-ordered time. Even my dumb kind of thing of saying, why did I say that at that time? So I had a minute with her as we're doing the check, sharing with her about the church and uh, that there's this girl that she just looks like her, you know, pretty girl and really lovely person. I thought it was you and and I was just able to sow a little bit about the church and a little bit about Jesus. I don't know where that's going to go, but it's like I felt the Spirit prompting me. Sometimes it's your own thoughts. You're not too sure. You've got to step out in faith and, and let God work through you. Last Sunday night, I wasn't involved in the service at all. I'm at the back, but I really felt, oh, I think the Holy Spirit wants to speak to some people. So there's a guy here for the first time on a Sunday night. He'd been to one Sunday morning and didn't know, and I felt there was a word for him. So I qualified and said, look, I could be wrong. It could be out of my own head or it could be God. I said, if it's God, it's God. If it's not, God's perfect, I'm imperfect. I could make a mistake. So you never say, God told me. Please don't say that. God told me, and then don't say, it. I, the Lord, am speaking to you. <laughs> don't. It's you speaking, and you think you've picked up the mind of the Spirit. So I gave it to him. Afterwards, he lined me up, wanted to talk, sat down, told me his story, it was like I was reading his life. It wasn't too intrusive what I shared, but you've got to have the courage to step out and actually speak it. Hey, listen, most of you here, all of you here, are sensible people. You, you are imminently normal, rational, <laughs> good. Okay? If you are basically a good person, you're not a, you're, in other words, you're not a nutter, you're not crazy where you are going to hurt people and say stupid things and, and that, but if, if you genuinely love people and you have a heart for them, then the Holy Spirit, you dial down, let the Holy Spirit speak through you and, uh, and He may give you something for a person. You've got to listen to the voice of the Spirit, you've got to be ready to hear, you've got to act upon His promptings. As long as you qualify and say you could be wrong and you never know, a miracle just may happen. This week it could happen to you. You've got God in you. This is the second great way by which Philip was able to, to reach people supernaturally. It wasn't just through the hard time but a time when the, He allowed the Spirit to speak and He was listening for the voice of God. So you have my permission to step out in faith and share with somebody but qualify it. And you never know, this week at school, university, home, neighbourhood, God could use you through His Holy Spirit just to speak to people through you. Finally, when Philip begins reaching out to others, it was when the need was so obvious. And the need was so obvious. So the unit goes, here's a way. So Philip's 
from Jerusalem, he's been to Samaria, time of need. The Spirit leads him to the eunuch. God gets saved. Now he's just kind of like, where is he? Well, he's on the coast, the Mediterranean coast. So let me show you the map where he is. Do you see the first arrow, number one, from Jerusalem up to Samaria? And it goes down to the desert, Gaza. The guy leaves. So where is he? The town of Gaza. Then there's the town of Azotus. Then there's the town of Joppa. Then there's the town of Caesarea. So there are just coastal towns and cities there. And so it says in verse 40, Philip, however, appeared at Azotus, Azotus and travelled about preaching the gospel. In other words, sharing about Jesus in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. It was obvious that where there are people who don't know Jesus, where there are towns that don't have Christian communities, he didn't have to pray about it. He didn't have to have an angel tell him. He didn't need the Spirit's guidance. It was obvious. Sometimes it's just obvious that there's a need and if you have compassion and the love of God flowing through you, you just want to meet that need. Compassion for people drives us to share the good news about Jesus and to care for them. It's not just speaking about Jesus to people, it's also caring for them. And that's why when Tim listed some of the stuff we do in community stuff, like the one in ten ministry is caring for people's practical needs. And I would say one in ten is, may the Holy Spirit use you to start conversations where you can actually share the love of Christ. And that's certainly, I know, what, what Peter's heart is as he leads it. You think of all the other practical ministries, maybe in Christmas in the square, why don't you just step out and talk to somebody, say, hey, you've been here before and, you know, if, if you wander around and, and maybe ask somebody, you've been here before and, you know, who invited you and what do you think and you just don't know where it will go. The needs are obvious. So we are to share, we're to care and to connect people into Christian communities. Folks, that's one of the reasons why we're making changes to the, uh, the early morning service. If you read my letter, and uh, it's in the, um, the entranceway there, but, and also Sunday night, this is a big room. Now, for this service, we're great. We can sit anywhere where we want to sit. But, you know, when you 500-seat auditorium, when you've got 100 people and you have visitors coming, I tell you, sometimes you have one person there and there's four, there's four rows behind. You've got three there, then there's great gaps. And you have people who are visiting that are really isolated. It's, it's, it can be a difficult situation so it took some of our guest speakers speaking to me saying Bill have you thought of actually not rocket science of actually having everyone sitting in those first rows here so that a sense of intimacy so that strangers don't feel they're they're stuck there and and uh, he goes because I found it really awkward to connect it took people who were our guests to wake me up to say you know what if we're really caring for people we want to create an atmosphere and an environment and a space. And then what we're going to do is we want to fill this place at 8.30 is we can gradually move back. We're going to have some beautiful uh, banners and stuff like that. And so next Sunday morning at 8.30 and also in our night service, we're going to do that, creating space. Now, for some of you, you might say, but I've been sitting in that seat for the last 15 years. Well, it's time to move in Jesus' name. <laughs> Come and take my seat. No, seriously, why? Because we love people and we've got to care for them and make this an environment that is friendly and also an environment that is inducive for worship, united together in corporate worship and praise and preaching. So it's going to be great. And so that one hour service, just pray for me that I can preach for 20 minutes what I do normally in 40 minutes. Okay, so hey, let me finish with this scripture so we can pray together. I love this scripture. Jesus went everywhere. He went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Now, you might think, man, you've done a lot. You've gone through all the towns and all the villages. It's time to have a break. When I came back from Solomon Islands, I did 22 preaching spots, teaching spots in uh, six days, two days traveling. So I came back and I could have taken two days off, three days off very easily. Sometimes the last thing you want is to see people. You love people, but sometimes you just are peopled out. You know, you're like, I've talked, 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 preach, 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 preach. I just need to watch some sport. Just watch, let me watch a cricket match and just veg out, you know, or, or play with the grandkids. Jesus is experiencing this and he goes, look at this. When he saw the crowds, 
By the way, when I came back, I went straight to Murray Bridge and I went to for three days with our staff and then went to Lefebvre, so I haven't stopped. What drives you? When you see the crowds, when you see the needs, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. There he goes, he sees them harassed. Oh, he sees those wolves, those devils that are giving trouble to people. He wants to kick those wolves in the teeth and get rid of the enemy. Helpless. This is how we must see people. Lost. Helpless. And in a hopeless state. So let's not harden our hearts towards people who don't live like us, like Florence Young, breaking through the natural repulsion to reach people. Acceptance does not mean approval or agreement. We can accept people without approving their lifestyle. We can accept people without agreeing with their values. See, acceptance and salvation is offered to us by Jesus before our behaviour changes. Jesus didn't come to you and say, well, if you change your attitude and if you change your behaviour, I might save you. No, 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 it's free grace. It's free grace. He accepts us and loves us and offers us salvation and the gift of eternal life and he doesn't say, oh, wait till your behaviour changes first. Receiving God's free gift lovingly and gently leads us to change our beliefs and attitudes. When we see the love of God in Jesus hanging on a cross, his, Him bleeding, His blood covering our sin and giving us the gift of eternal life, forgiveness. He goes, that, that melts our hearts to want to change our beliefs, our attitudes, our mindsets and our behaviours. And this is what God's non-judgmental accepting love is all about. Christ died for the ungodly. He died for the unrighteous. He didn't die for the righteous. While we were still sinners, Christ sacrificed his life on a cross to save us. And Jesus, then he says the final thing, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. That's what Jesus is asking of us this Christmas season. December next week. A marvellous opportunity for seed sowing and reaping. Will you join with us? Have a life that's, that, that is purposeful. Reach out to people. Do it the three ways that Philip inspires us to do it. You might be going through a hard time. Let God have your heart and let him do something in you and through you. Be open to the Spirit to work through you supernaturally this week. And there are opportunities that arise. The needs are there. The needs are obvious. Let's reach out to people and let God use us. Let, the best, let this be the best December that we've had for many years. May this, if we finish the year on a powerful high with people coming to Christ, that we can commence the new year with fresh vigour and life. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Let's stand together.